Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in this world. Welcome to Restoration Fellowship, the name of this ministry, Sunday Church Bible Study. This is our homepage, focusonthekingdom.org, where you can find many other links to our magazine, which is a free online magazine. And we can also mail you a hard copy if you let us know. Focus on the Kingdom. And we have a podcast where you can listen to Anthony's many articles and books that he's recorded audio for. We have a theological conference online that we do every year around the springtime here in the south of Atlanta, Georgia, USA. <clears throat> so look for that next uh, year, 2025, God willing. And we have three other websites, thehumanjesus.org, ChristEnemyLove.com, and JesusKingdomGospel.com, tailor-made for those specific topics of Christology and enemy love and, of course, the kingdom. We have a section on books we have published and you can purchase and some you can read online for free, as well as article, articles and our beliefs and uh, also a donate button there. Okay, so we are continuing, in case you are not familiar with this, uh, we're continuing in the book of Genesis. We are in chapter 25, so what happens is Anthony reads through the scriptures, gives his commentary, and uh, if you have any questions pertaining to the main sermon at hand, please type them in all caps in the chat. And also, as is our tradition, we open, of course, with prayer, reciting of the Shema by Anthony, and continued prayers. Please keep in your minds and hearts uh, Tracy, our sister and ministry partner. She's uh, at the moment in Europe in fellowship with other fellow believers, and she'll be there for the next few weeks. Please keep her in your prayers and anyone and everyone she meets with. And also various prayers for uh, health and various surgeries and ailments um, uh, that have, that we have come to know about. So prayers for Jenny and her family in Australia and continued prayers for others. And Anthony, good morning. Good morning, yes. Thank you for that introduction. And as is our custom on Resurrection Sunday, we believe the resurrection to have been on Sunday and the crucifixion on Friday, Friday being the 15th of Nisan. And with that in mind, then it's our custom to remind you that the greatest of all the commandments that God ever gave to man is found in what's called the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. And that verse is cited and approved by Jesus in Mark 12, 29. This is the most stupendous fact, I think, available in the whole study of theology. So it sounds like this in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, which means, correctly translated, listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, one Lord. How many Lords is one Lord? Give that some thought, and I think it will make you realize how true some of those early statements that Carlos was playing for us are. Jesus was a Jew, and he's concerned with defining God correctly. So you may respectfully ask your local church, if you're going there, how many lords is one lord? That's a great question, liable to cause some good discussion, even argumentation. So with that in mind, um, we will ask God to bless what we do this morning. If you'd pray with me now, either looking up to heaven or bowing your head, whatever is your custom, we will pray for the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the one true God, the only God there is, to bless what we do this Resurrection Sunday morning. Our Father, Jesus taught us to pray to you, the Father, our Father, the Father of all true believers. We ask you to be with us through this miracle of technology. We thank you for the talent and the skills 
of our brothers and sisters who have this amazing ability to lay on this uh, joint meeting week by week, Resurrection Sunday by Resurrection Sunday. We ask you to be with us now in your spirit. Jesus, we pray to you and thank you for dying for us on the cross. But above all, we pray for the coming of your kingdom of God on earth to relieve and put an end forever to the chaos and confusion we now see, the killing, the mass murder, not only in abortion, as Carlos was showing us, but in the senseless murder of people in warfare. We pray that that day may come to an end, that your will would be done upon the earth as being done in heaven. Be with us now, grant us your operational presence and the power of your spirit to enlighten our minds as we read these amazing verses in the book of Genesis. Strengthen us now for what lies ahead and bring the day when the garden tools will replace the awful weapons of destruction which now threaten the lives of many innocent people. Our prayers offered as always every Resurrection Sunday morning in the name of the Messiah Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. Anthony will be back, as I said. We're in the book of Genesis, chapter 25. But before then, a uh, youth lesson from Barbara. Good morning, everyone. And good morning, especially my dear young inheritors of the kingdom. Back to Abraham. This is an imaginary conversation between two people, Bob and Todd. And I've asked Sarah to help me. Sarah, I'm Todd and you're Bob. <laughs> I'm Bob, you're Todd. <laughs> Todd, I know how seriously you take your faith. I've seen you reading your Bible during break time, and I've really appreciated our discussions. As I understand it, Abraham was the first Christian. Is that how you see it? Well, I don't know much about Abraham. I was thinking about him this week. And I was wondering if today's Christians believe the same things that Abraham did. What do you think? Do you believe the same things that Abraham did? I guess so. <laughs> so you believe in the land promise? No, never heard of it. But that's what Abraham believed. In fact, the Abrahamic covenant was created around it. Well, my church is more New Testament oriented. But Jesus believed in the same promise. And while stu studying Abraham this week, I found that there are 75 times that Abraham is spoken about in the New Testament. So he must be very important. Well, I guess my church just puts a different emphasis on things. Okay, but it seems that what was important to Jesus should be important to us. Do you ever wonder when and how we stopped believing important things like the land promise? Well, you're making me wonder now. Um, I guess if Jesus talked about it 75 times about Abraham, that, yeah, I guess it's important. <laughs> Great. Let's get together and take a look at Abraham. And let's see if we believe the same things that Abraham and the early Christians believed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. And my dear young inheritors of the kingdom, let's have a look and see if we believe the same things that Abraham believed. Remember that we looked at the land promise in Genesis 13, 14 and 15. And it says, look as far as you can in every direction. Look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. <coughs> Note that the, the directions that he, he gives are points of the compass. They're, they're actual um, geographical uh, directions. He did not say, look up to heaven, and when you die, you can come up here and be with me. So how does that land promise have anything to do with us? Because Abraham's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-great, I think you get the point, great, great, great grandchildren were to have that same promise and the same land. Sometimes it's called the blessing of Abraham. In fact, there are um, three names for the same thing, the land promise, the promised land, and the blessing of Abraham. And remember that we discovered that same promise 
was given to David, to Jesus, and to the meek, which is to say us, if we are meek and humble. Let's just imagine a little bit about Abraham's life. Consider how very different his circumstances are to ours. He was told to go and he went, but he had no GPS to say, turn here or keep straight or even do a U-turn or you have reached your destination. The fact is that he believed God and that meant he obeyed God, but he didn't have, and I think this is huge, he didn't have the benefit of Sunday school lessons. Abraham's father had been a pagan, worshiping idols and multiple gods. Abraham knew nothing at all about God or his plan. Imagine what his wife Sarah might have had to say when she was told they were moving. Where are we going to? I don't know. How long will it take? I don't know. What will it be like? I think Abraham might have fudged a little here and painted a very glowing picture. And then she might have asked, why are we going? And he might have answered, because the Lord said so. There is, however, a problem for us to sort out, a puzzle, something that doesn't seem to make sense. And it comes right from scripture. Acts 7.5 says this, Abraham did not inherit as much as a square foot of the promised land. But God had promised it to him and to his children forever. Abraham died without receiving what God promised him. We'll find the answer to this mystery in another lesson. If you know the answer, good for you. If you don't, don't worry. God does not lie. All right. Thank you, Barbara. Good entry into the death of Father Abraham. And Anthony, it's all yours. Okay, we're in chapter 25 of the book of Genesis. That's the Greek word for beginning. It occurs at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, which is the new beginning in terms of the new covenant. We know as the new covenant scriptures, you should really call them new covenant rather than new testament. But right now we're dealing with old covenant times and the promise of Abraham and as Barbara and Sarah were clearly saying to us just now, Abraham was a believer. He was a Christian. Abraham is called a Christian. So he's a Christian ahead of time. That's why we read that the gospel, that's the gospel of the kingdom. You always need to say gospel of the kingdom because people don't know what that gospel is. The gospel about the kingdom was preached ahead of time to Abraham. So Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was able to even argue with God and persuade God not to destroy a certain area. So it's a very important position that Abraham had. Barbara was reminding me this morning in her reading of the Old Covenant Scriptures, these people were very human. They were far from being perfect. You remember that there was drunkenness, there was incest even in the family history of those people in Genesis. That's comforting for us. The, these people, these heroes of the faith, Abraham the friend of God, Abraham the believer, was far from sinless. As we're going to see, he twice actually lied about the status of Sarah, his first wife. You remember that uh, there was drunkenness in the case of Noah. There was incest in another story. I find that comforting because God is not expecting us to be sinlessly perfect, but we'd better be right rather than wrong. And that's a matter of obedience to the words and the word of God, the gospel of the kingdom. So in chapter 25 of Genesis, Abraham, which means father of a great multitude of people. And if you're listening today as a Christian, you are one of that great multitude of children of Abraham because you believe the same great promises that Abraham believed. That's a very good status to have. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. Well, he had, as you know, then three ladies in his life, starting with Sarai, his first wife. And then there's a third one here. 
and he, she is known as a concubine. It was uh, permissible in those days to have more than one sexual partner, certainly not permitted today, but Abraham had a third uh, person with him in his life here. She was Ketura. And then you have a mass of genealogical records here, which must be supremely important. I don't know who all these people were. It's really hard to get your mind around all of this. These heroes of the faith were very human, let me tell you, very human. They were not sinless, but they're still called friends of God, able to argue with God. And God is seen as a, <coughs> a very, <coughs> excuse me, God is seen as very active and as a person, a single individual person. All that I find comforting and encouraging. So in verse 5, you'll see that Abraham gave all that he had to Yitzhak, Isaac. Everybody knows Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That gives you at least three in the genealogical line. Isaac then was the recipient of things that Abraham gave. Abraham was very giving, very decent, very uh, much a peacemaker, you see, although he made some mistakes, as is also shown in these stories. To the sons of his concubines, in verse 6 of Genesis 25, Abraham gave gifts. These stories are full of giving and helpfulness and friendship interspersed, of course, with some catastrophic mistakes, as in the case of incest, in the case of Lot, and other mistakes that were made. So take that as your standard background. These are very human, human beings. They make mistakes, and yet they are the heroes of the faith. They are your ancestors spiritually. Romans 4.17 says, the promise to Abraham that he would be the inheritor of the world. If that doesn't get your attention, I don't know what will. I remind you then of Jeremiah 27, verse 5, for your notes. Jeremiah 27, 5, I will, by my great power, I created the earth. This is God speaking here. Jeremiah 27, 5, I made all the animals and the people on the earth, and I, God, decide who will rule the earth. Did you hear that? I, God, am the one to decide who's going to rule the world. Do they talk about anything else in America these days? time of election? No. The issue before all of us every day is who's going to rule the world for God? That's your challenge. That's your career prospect. So then we live, we, we find rather in verse 7, all the years of Abraham's life he lived, 175 years. These people are living twice as long as we do today. It's an unreal world and yet very human. These people knew God personally. They argued with God sometimes, and God listened to what they had to say. I find that very interesting and encouraging. Abraham finally, in verse 8, breathed his last. He didn't pass away, as was customary said today, very misleadingly. When people die, you hear, oh, they passed away. They didn't pass away. Let's use the language of the Bible in order to teach the truth to ourselves and everybody who hears us. But he breathed his last breath and died and was gathered to his people. Where were his people? In the grave. So Daniel 12, verse 2 is your key sleep of the dead text. Many of those sleeping in the dust of the ground, that tells you what they're doing, sleeping, where they're doing it, in the dust of the ground. They're going to be resurrected. So resurrection from the sleep of death is the only way back to life. And that's the tremendous prospect that you and I have if we are following the faith of Abraham who had the gospel preached to him ahead of time. So then what happened here in verse 9? His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite. So these were not Semitic people, Hittite, the, one, the ones who generously gave him a place to bury his family. 
they are the enemies, so to speak. They're the, not the true people of God. But Abraham had bought that field, in verse 10, from the sons of Heth, the Hittite. Abraham was buried there with his wife, Sarah. And after the death of Abraham, so here we come to the end of the life of Abraham, 175 years old, staggering. It's a symbol then of eternal life because you and I are in the Christian business, so to speak, in search of life forever and ever and ever, indestructible life. Abraham lived for 175 years and he will live again in that future first resurrection, which will occur at the end of a future great tribulation. After the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac and Isaac lived by Be'er Lahai Roy. Lots of names for God based on the events that happened there. This, it has to do with a well, and it's one of the names of God. God's name is revealed as uh, different aspects of God's activity. And here, that particular place, and I think Barbara mentioned that in Act 7, Stephen in his sermon referred to these events about the burial of Abraham and Acts 7, I won't turn to it for the sake of time, but Acts 7, Stephen, who died preaching this sermon, he was stoned, he was killed rather, by an angry religious opposition. He was dying then, referring to this event by which Abraham buried his wife Sarah in that famous field uh, as we read in this passage here after the death of abraham god blessed his son isaac and of course jacob so we know god as the god of abraham and isaac and jacob that is not the trinitarian god there is no triune god that's a later development you should be aware of that and you can simply ask your friends in a respectful way, what is the Shema? Is that a Trinitarian creed or a Unitarian creed? The answer is that the God of the Shema was a Unitarian, Unitary monotheistic God, certainly not a Trinitarian God. So that should give you pause to think through that important matter of the definition of God. So then in verse 12, we get to the descendants of Ishmael. Ishmael. Uh, recorded here, his descendants are recorded, Abraham's son, Ishmael, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. That then was the second uh, sexual partner of Abraham. That was permissible at that time, of course. And we find that story in the book of Galatians also as models of the old and the new covenant. Hagar, the Egyptian, is not a positive figure in that uh, later description but sarah is the one that you need to keep an eye on she was the genuine representative of the new covenant so that whole story is developed in galatians the whole book and also in acts chapter 7. so you have the sons of ishmael here they are kida abdil mibsam Mishma Duma Mas, I don't expect anybody to remember all those names. These are the sons of Ishmael in verse 16. These are their names by their villages, by their camps. Twelve princes according to their tribes. Twelve is the number of foundation. So just as you have twelve children of Israel, you have twelve children of the opposite camp, the Egyptian children by Hagar. Abraham's second uh, sexual partner. In 17 then, we have the years of the life of Ishmael, born of Hagar, as we just said, and he lived for 137 years. I hadn't realized that until I studied this for this morning's preparation. He breathed his last, he died. Say it plainly, when people die, they die. They don't pass away. You are feeding the lie of the immortal soul, Satan's first lie when he said you shall not surely die, every time you utter the notion of passing on. 
That's false to scripture. The Bible has it right here. He breathed his last and died, was gathered his people. So these uh, children uh, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham, settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as one goes towards Assyria. I call your attention to the name Assyria. Assyria is the enemy at the future prophecies of the Bible. It is not Rome, it is not Europe, that is key. But the Assyrians are to be the enemies of the people of Israel in the great tribulation of the future. And I hasten to add this too, Assyria is also connected to Iran. You don't know that perhaps, but you'll find in, in Ezra, the book of Ezra, that Iran, Persia, is also called Assyria. So Assyria seems to be the name of the future enemies, and that could be a reference at least uh, partially to Iran. And that name Iran, of course, is in the news today in terms of the awful shooting, assassination attempt on the life of the current or former president, I should say, President Trump. So there you have that the, the wind up of Abraham's personal story. And then we move naturally to the descendants of Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took his wife, Rebecca, who had that beautiful story of a servant being sent by Abraham to find a wife for Isaac. And that person was, of course, Rebecca. Rivka in Hebrew means a noose. Okay, it looks like we lost Anthony for some reason. So, <laughs> not sure what happened there. Maybe his connection failed. So we'll try and uh, reconnect. And I'll just uh, read some of the rest here. Uh, let's see. Uh, actually, I'll just give some time to for Anthony to come back here and see what happened. So just some comments about what we've been reading thus far. Um, I was noting, so Anthony was saying how Abraham was a Christian. And this is exactly what Jesus himself says in John 8. So if we go to John 8, and you know the story there with the Pharisees once again debating. Um, and Abraham is mentioned quite a lot in this chapter of John the Gospel of John chapter 8. So while we wait here for Anthony, let me show you the references Jesus makes to Abraham. And it starts there in verse uh, 33. So the Jews say to Jesus, we're descendants of Abraham. We have never been enslaved to anyone. How, can they, how then can you say you will become free? And Jesus obviously alluding here to perhaps the system that he's bringing about as the new covenant, the Lord of the new covenant, new covenant messenger. And he says, I assure you of this, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain a member of the household forever, but a son does remain forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you really will be free. I recognize that you are descendants of Abraham, but you're trying to kill me because my gospel word makes no progress in you. I speak what I have learned and understood in the princes of my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. So then the Jews say to Jesus, uh, probably outraged, um, you know, our father is Abraham. Uh, and then <laughs> Jesus says, if you were Abraham's children or seed offspring, you would be doing what Abraham did. But in fact, you're trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, the truth which I heard from God. Abraham certainly did not do this. And then um, he goes on to 
mention once again Abraham later in this chapter. The Jews said, now we know for certain that you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. So as we saw, Abraham certainly is dead and is in the grave. Uh, the Hebrew shell, the Greek Hades, which uh, time permitting, and if Anthony returns, we'll do at the end here. And then, uh, but you say, if anyone keeps my gospel word, he will never experience death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And that is the point, right? Uh, that is the, um, the big issue with uh, the Jews and Jesus uh, accepting him as greater even than their father, um, their father Abraham. So even the prophets died. Who do you think you are? <laughs> so see, that that's the big issue. Nothing to do with Jesus being God or Yahweh in the flesh, etc. It all has to do with him being the Messiah. And then again, uh, Abraham, and this is what I wanted to get to, where Jesus says, your father Abraham was overjoyed at the prospect that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced looking forward to the future. So Abraham certainly was a Christian. In other words, he looked forward to the Messianic age, to the day of the Messiah, although obviously he did not see Jesus uh, in person because Jesus had you know, was not, had not been procreated, begotten yet in the womb of Mary. But he certainly was a Christian in terms of his messianic expectation of the coming kingdom and, the, of course, the coming king. And then the Jews uh, say, you are not yet, you are not even 50 years old. You have seen Abraham. So you see how they, I don't know if they're doing this uh, willingly or ignorantly misinterpreting Jesus or twisting what he's saying, who knows, but they're confusing, obviously, what Jesus, or twisting, I should say, what Jesus said about Abraham saw the, the day of the Messiah, the Messianic age, with seeing the actual person of Abraham. That's not what Jesus just said. And then let me assure you on the highest authority before Abraham ever existed, I am, in Anthony's translation there adds the Messiah, because it's only right that the uh, phrase there, I am, the Greek is unqualified. In other words, it simply reads, I am. But obviously everywhere else, when Jesus uses the phrase, I am, it means he is who he says he is, that is the Messiah of God, the anointed one of God. So yeah, uh, certainly Jesus said Abraham was a Christian. <clears throat> and uh, something else I noticed in the Genesis 25 is uh, verse, where is it? Uh, where it says that he was satisfied uh, verse 8, Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man satisfied with life. Now that's interesting because uh, if we look at Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see that Hebrews says, uh, the, the writer there, that Abraham died without receiving the promise the promised land, the kingdom. But he nonetheless was satisfied with his life. Isn't that interesting? So I think that's a good example for us who might die before we get the promise, before we see the coming of the uh, Messiah of God to establish the kingdom and give us the land that is, which becomes the world. And, um, take possession of them, of the nations, and start ruling with Messiah and the other saints, like Abraham. So that's a good, that's an interesting thing uh, that I really like, where um, he nonetheless died satisfied with his life, even though he had yet to receive the uh, promise. <clears throat> 
Uh, something else of interest here was verse 6. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still alive and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. Uh, the Ryrie Study Bible says, though Abraham provided for all his children by giving them gifts, probably started flocks and herds, he dismissed them and made Isaac his principal heir. And that's a quote from the Ryrie Study Bible in verse 6. So yes, that certainly is true. Isaac is the promised seed, right? The one through whom the promises will continue of the coming kingdom and the land, which becomes the land promise, the uh, which becomes the the promise to the whole world, right? And uh, yeah, so okay, let's see. Just waiting on Anthony here, who's connecting connection dropped out uh, briefly. Let's see, we have some comments here while we wait. Uh, I saw one. All right, th this is uh, of interest too. So we have Abraham died. Let me go back to the Genesis 25. So it says, uh, he lived 175 years, breathed his last, died a ripe old age, satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. That phrase is interesting. Uh, it appears a lot throughout the Old Testament. When people die, they're gathered to the to their people. You also have the phrase, they go to their fathers. And we read that back in Genesis chapter 15. And um, also the phrase, to sleep with my fathers, Genesis 47, also Deuteronomy 31. These are all synonyms for dead, pe dead people in the grave. So when you die, you are said to go to your father. So I think I see Anthony back. I see you and I'll bring you up. Briefly here, Anthony, just making some. So that's very important to see this uh, phraseology for death. So when people die, they're, they're said to go to their people in the grave. Shell is the Hebrew, as we know. S-H-E-O-L, as it's transliterated from the Hebrew. And time permitting, I'll, I'll talk more about that uh, at the end. You there, Anthony? I'm here. So are we okay. going back to chapter 25? Or yep, so I was just uh, making some comments about chapter 25, and I think you're at uh, verse 19. Uh, I had just finished 25, actually, but we can go back. Yeah, you, you, were, you were disconnected. We couldn't you. see you. So we lost you when you were talking about verse 19 following. Right. We'll go back to 19 of verse, uh, chapter 25. Yeah. Thanks. These are the records of the generations of Yitzhak, Isaac, who is Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac, Yitzhak. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah or Rivka, which means bound like a noose attached to somebody very strongly. Rebekah was the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, Syrian of Padan Aram and the sister of Laban, who was Rebecca's brother, incidentally. It takes a while to figure out who's who in the story. The Arameans, the Syrians, in prophecy, are going to be the enemies of Israel in the end times. And I gave you then, before I think we got disconnected, Isaiah 11.4, which says, the Assyrian is the enemy at the end time. And Paul equates that Assyrian in Isaiah 11.4 with the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. So that's a very good connection. 114, double it, 228, 2 Thessalonians 2.8. The Assyrian is the one to keep your eye on. And let me mention to you that in Ezra chapter 6, 
Iran is actually called the Assyrian. That could be significant because you've heard currently in the news the connection with Assyria, the connection with Iran, therefore, of the recent terrible assassination attempt on President Trump. So keep your eye on Assyria, the Assyrian possibly connected then with Iran, and let's see how that works out. So we're back then in verse 21 of Genesis 26. Isaac prayed to the Lord. I love the intimate relation of these great fathers of the church, we might call them, have with God. They're treating God as a real person who can even be argued with in, in a good way. God is very much personal, far from being a triune, a mystery. He's the one God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Isaac prayed to the Lord, to Yahweh, yod heh vav -He, on behalf of his wife, Rebekah, because she was barren. And Yahweh replied, or as my margin there says, was entreated by her. God listened to her prayer. We should treat God as one who intervenes on our behalf when we pray to him intensely for certain things we want to happen. So Rebecca then conceived. There's a miraculous conception. So we're repeating the story, are we not, of Sarah herself, because she had been unable to conceive until miraculously she did. In this case, this subsequent story is a repetition really of that. The children struggled together within her. That shows that a child unborn in the womb is still a person. These two twins, as they turned out to be in her womb, struggled in the womb. They're not impersonal fetuses, as somebody has said. They're real persons with a destiny. So she went to inquire of Yahweh in verse 22. And God answers her quite deliberately and directly. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, as Jacob and Esau. Two different people will be separated from your body. They're very much persons, certainly not fetuses as though they don't count. They are absolutely real people, real personalities with a destiny, even when in the womb. One of those people will be stronger than the other, God predicted, and the older one, Esau, is going to serve the younger. That was a reverse policy, was it not? The normal thing would be that the elder one would be senior to the younger one, but God reversed that here. The elder one, Esau in this case, is going to be servant to the younger one, Jacob. That's very interesting. The point here is that God arranges things as he chooses, not always the way we want it done, but God intervened then to direct the course of history. Verse 24, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, well, there were twins. So now we learn a new fact. These were twins in the womb. And the first came forth, red, Esau. Edom has to do with redness. Adam has to do with redness because we're all created from the dust. And all over, he was like a hairy garment. And they named him Esau. And he is not then to be the senior one in God's plan. Afterwards, secondly, Yaakov, Jacob, came forth with his hand holding onto Esau's heel. So their future history was happening even in the womb. And Jacob then is one who supplants the other one. This is a reverse of what we would expect, but God is in charge of all of these events. 27, when the boys grew up, their careers were as follows. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Yaakov, Jacob, the supplanter, was a peaceful man. So he's the one that gets our attention here. He was a man of peace, living in tents. 
And in 28, we read that Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. But Rebecca, who's really the star of the story, loved or preferred, we should say, Jacob. So in 29, when Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and was famished. He was very hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, his twin, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff, for I'm famished. Therefore his name was called Edom, which means red, like Adam, who was made from the ground also. But Jacob said, verse, sell me your birthright. So an extraordinary trick now followed. And Jacob said to him, sell me your birthright. You have a right to be the first, but I'm going to get your birthright transferred to me. Esau said, I'm about to die. So what use then is the birthright to me? This shows a terrible carelessness about your birthright. So applying that to yourself, are you careless in any way about the amazing truths that have been revealed to us? Or are you taking them with utmost seriousness? Well, Esau was not behaving as he should have. Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. That was a ghastly mistake within the providence of God. God worked with that decision, but the lesson is a very severe one for us. We better not take for granted our birthright as children of Abraham. Abraham being the first Christian had the gospel preached ahead of time to him. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went on his way. Thus, Esau, this is the lesson we learn, Esau, Edom, despised his birthright. Your birthright is the kingdom of God gospel. You are being trained now to rule the world with Jesus. As I read to you from Jeremiah 27, verse 5, God is the one who decides who's going to rule the world. If you're not taken with the idea of ruling the world, you haven't understood your birthright fully, and we recommend that we all meditate on that. Yeah, just briefly, Anthony, get your uh, feedback on Paul yeah. uses this story, as we know, in uh, Romans yeah. chapter 9. Yes. Uh, the context there is about his great longing for Israel to be saved. In other words, all his Israelite brothers and sisters yes. by blood. And I'll just read a, a few here. Um, Good. It is not as though the gospel word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are the true Israel, nor are they Abraham's children just because they are his descendants. Instead, through Isaac, your descendants will be counted. Yes. That is, it is not the children of physical descent who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as true descendants. Yes. For these are the words of the promise. About this time next year, I will, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebecca conceived twins by one man, by our forefather Isaac, even before the twins were born, before either had done anything good or bad, so that the purpose of God in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, yes. a favorite Calvinist verse. <laughs> yes. Rebecca was told, the older brother will serve the younger one, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Just get your comments on Paul's use there. Of well, yes, most important. There was, I think, a little bit of vagueness in some of the comments that were played before we started our program today. They need to be clarified. The Israel of God means the international believers. The true Israel are not the ones who are physical descendants of Abraham. Those are what we would call Jews today. Israel, the nation today, is no more Christian than any other nation because all the kingdoms of this present evil system are pagan by definition. You have to come out of those systems in order to be a member of true Israel and you need to have the faith of Abraham. That's a very important distinction. So the Israel of God 
as you mentioned, Regulation 616, is the international true believers, the true spiritual sons of Abraham. They're the, one, they're the ones who count. They're the ones who are being schooled to rule or trained to reign in the kingdom of God. So that's a very important distinction. Um, as we see here, Esau made a terrible mistake. He took lightly his birthright. So my appeal to you listening this morning, are you taking for granted what God is training you to be, to rule the world with Messiah? Don't take that for granted because there's no re reason for carelessness there. Yeah, what's interesting, Anthony, about Paul's use of the Esau yes. uh, story yes. is that he uses it to make a rather outrageous claim yes uh even though he has a heart for his fellow israelites mm -hmm. he uses these stories in genesis about abraham jacob isaac to say to his own blood brethren mm -hmm. kingsmen yes you know what it's not by blood it's not by descent it's not by yeah. you know nationality it's by something else this yes. promise and this obedience of faith Yes, by our forefathers like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So that's uh, quite amazing for a Jew to to do yes. that, isn't it? It's wonderful. And you mentioned there uh, a verse that I was going to mention clearly, Hebrews five verse nine. You just quoted that has the phrase the obedience of faith. It's not obeying the law of Moses in the letter that will get you nowhere. That's the old covenant. That's the wrong covenant. It's the obedience of faith. There's no faith without obedience. And there's no obedience without faith. So believing the promises made to Abraham, the land promise that Barbara and Sarah were talking about earlier on, that's where your belief needs to, to rest. And for that, you do Mark 1, verses 14 and 15, the beginning of the gospel. The gospel does not, I repeat, does not begin with the death of Jesus, that's very important. The death of Jesus is essential, the atoning death. It begins with the teaching of Jesus. I repeat, the teaching of Jesus is what you must start with. 50% of your new covenant scriptures has to do with the teaching of Jesus, the Messiah. Okay. A uh, quick question here from Michelle. Did God actually hate Esau? Or is that, or does that word mean something like love yeah. less? I think, I think Michelle's right there. It doesn't mean that God hated Esau literally because God doesn't hate sin, sinners, people. But I think love less by comparison would be the idiomatic meaning of that. Yes, he didn't want to choose one and he makes that sovereign choice. I understand that. But it's a good point there on the part of Michelle. Love less by comparison would be the meaning. God yeah, it's similar, it. Anthony, I think uh, it's similar to how Jesus uses the word hate. Yes. In, uh, I think it's Luke 14, mm -hmm. where he says, whoever does not hate yes. their mother or father. Yes. But in the Matthew version of the same saying, um, it says, uh, if anyone, if if you love your family or even your own, your own life more than me, Good. More than so, it's a more and less yes. uh, issue there. Good. That's All right. Do you want to continue go. to chapter twenty-six? Yes. Let's see what we can do with twenty-six. There was a famine in the land. That's a bad scene. A famine, besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar. We'll find that south of Jerusalem there, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Philistines, remember, are the enemy, the non-Semitic people. They're in the land of Canaan, which is going to be given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and given to you as the center of the future kingdom of God. And the Lord Yahweh, yod he vav -He, appeared to Isaac, and here's what was said. Do not go down to Egypt. I was 
uh, before we got cut off here, pointing out as you go down to Egypt, that's a bad thing. Egypt is a symbol of confusion and chaos, everything bad. You go up to Jerusalem, which is the center of the future kingdom of God, I put it this way. When you read in Luke that the Lord God will give to Jesus the kingdom of his father David, people knew what that meant. The Lord God was going to give to Jesus the kingdom of his ancestor David. That sums up the whole biblical story. People don't know what that means today. They knew them. There was no argument about that. And so that kingdom of David will be given to the one to whom it rightly belongs in the future when Christ comes back at his second coming, Parousia. So the instructions then in verse 3 were this sojourn. A sojourner is a temporary resident. I am a green card person in America. I can relate to this well. I'm not a citizen but I enjoy the benefits of living in an extraordinary country as a sojourner. I'm only a temporary resident because my real residence is going to be in that future kingdom of God when Christ returns. So I will be with you and I will bless you. The word blessing and bless occurs multiple times in the book of Genesis as it does throughout the, uh, the New Covenant and else. Old Covenant Scriptures, of course. But in verse 4, we have a reference to the oath. When God swears something, that puts all argument to rest. So the Bible is about the land promise. That's to say the possession of that land, not just inheriting the land. That implies some death. And we know that God cannot die. So blessed are the meek, we would say. They're going to possess the whole earth. That's exactly what Jesus said when he uttered these words to his disciples. Fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure. He's delighted, we might say. He's thrilled to pieces to give you the kingdom, to possess the kingdom. This is the land promise. God swore this in verse 3, so it's absolutely certain. Verse 4, I'm going to multiply your seed, your descendants. The word seed is a very powerful word because it obviously means descendants. And we all know about seeds that are planted in the ground, how they produce flowers and fruit and so on. So it's a powerful way of describing your descendants, those who come after you. And they're going to be like the stars of heaven. In Daniel 12, verse 3, you'll find that those who cause people to be right, those who teach the truth are going to be God's stars. So we can say with confidence that God has his Hollywood stars. They're not the ones that the world recognizes, but rather his stars like Abraham, who is a friend of God, and David, who despite his catastrophic sin, on one occasion is God's star. So, they're going to be like the stars of heaven. Sometimes they're said to be like the sand of the sea. And by your seed, your descendants, that word seed, spora, we have the word sperma and spora in the Greek language, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So this is an international. Nobody can say that you're not part of the church because you're such and such nationality. If you're a follower of the faith of Abraham, then you are a genuine believer. That is not just Jews. Although we have to add there is in prophecy a great future for the Jews, but that hasn't happened. The fact that they're back in the land proves nothing. They're actually going to be kicked out in the future in the Great Tribulation. <coughs> okay. And here's the reason. Because Abraham obeyed me and we were just referring to this important verse in hebrews 5 verse 9 the obedience of faith great deal of unnecessary argument about faith and works and all that the simple truth is that it's the obedience of faith no faith without obedience no obedience without faith you have to believe what people say the mistake that many churchgoers make is that they think that the gospel consists only of the death burial and resurrection of jesus that is false 
Jesus spoke about the promise of the coming kingdom for years before he even mentioned his death. His death is very important, but more important is the promise made to Abraham that he and all the true believers in Messiah would be heirs, possessors of the world. You're in training then to be rulers of the world. I hope that's clear. And it's all because Abraham obeyed me. The obedience of faith. You have to obey the gospel. You have to say, yes, God, I believe what you say is true. I also believe that Jesus died for my sins. If you're on that track, then you're in sync with the biblical view of the gospel. So in verse 6, Isaac lived in Gerar, south of Jerusalem. When the men of the place asked about his wife, here you're going to rem remember this story happened once before, didn't it? When the men of the place asked about his wife, Isaac's wife, that is, he said, she's my sister. That was a great mistake. But he did it out of fear. Once again, I repeat my point that these heroes of the faith are far from sinless. They make mistakes. Fear caused him to say, she's my sister. Thinking out of fear that the men of that place might kill me. So I was scared then of getting killed, so I lied about who she was on the question of Rebecca's relationship to him. So it's a brutal world today in politics. It's a brutal world at that time too. Fear of losing his wife to a pagan person out for beautiful women this caused then Isaac to make the same mistake as Abraham himself had made. The story is repeated. So it came about when he had been there for a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, that's the not the people of God, the Palestinians we would call them today, looked out through a window and saw Behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebecca. Then the Bimelech called Isaac and said, Certainly she is your wife. So he, called, he got called out for this mistake, and rightly. How in the world then were you able to say, She's my sister? Well, as you know, the story was that there was a half sister relationship. And the same error had been made by Abraham, as was repeated by Isaac. And Isaac said to him, because I said, I might die on account of her. Bimelech said, what is this you have done to us? They were very straightforward with each other. One of the people might easily have lain with your wife. And you would have brought guilt upon us. So they showed then some sense of rectitude and uh, correct behavior here themselves. Bimelech then charged all the people saying, he who touches this man, or his wife, is going to be executed. It's a brutal world, is it not? But actually they came out on the right side of the argument and they agreed that we must respect the husband-wife relationship involved here. So in verse 12, Isaac sowed in that land and reaped. That reminds, it reminds me, of course, of the parable of the sower. If you don't understand the parables, so you don't understand any of the parables Jesus said. It's all about sowing seed, either agriculturally, botanically, or physically sowing the seed of your descendants. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped. This is a very positive picture, a happy part of the story, and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. Remember, Jesus was intrigued with these ideas and gave parables about sowing and reaping a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The word blessing, by the way, occurs some over 300 times in the Old Covenant Scriptures, and this passage in Genesis is very much rich with the idea of blessing. Idea of blessing. Verse 14, he had possessions of flock. Look at the abundance here. Possessions of flocks and herds, and a great household. So the Philistines, envied him 
So God's people, his true people, were blessed by him when they did right. Their sins were overlooked when they did wrong. And this attracted the attention of these pagans. Verse 15, all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped up by filling them with earth. There you see the opposition then. That's an awful thing to do, to fill in a well to stop people getting water from it. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, separate from us, for you're too powerful for us. So there's a struggle over who's going to be in charge, who's powerful and so on. And Abimelech then wants Isaac to be removed from that area. You're much mightier than we are. So Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar, south of Jerusalem, and settled there. So there was a separation between the true people of God and their pagan counterparts. More trouble in verse 18 then. They fought over wells. Water, of course, is one of the great necessities of life. Wells are precious things. Jesus himself talked about the wells of living water, a spiritually beneficial thing. 18. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water, which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up. That's an awful thing to do. Had blocked these wells. That's a very hostile thing to do. And he gave them the same names which his father had given to those wells in verse 18 there. So struggles, political struggles, are a thing of the current days, as you well know from watching the news. Nothing much has changed. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, that's a brilliant symbol in the Bible. Wells of flowing water is a symbol of abundance and God's provision for our needs. But that wasn't the end of it. We're ne next we have a quarrel between the herdsmen of Gerar with the herdsmen of Isaac. So international squirrel, squabbles here. The water's ours, they said. No, this belongs to us. So he named the well Ezek, which has to do with contention. That's what the word means. Because they contended with them. All of which is to say that we need the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus was obsessed, we might say, with the time coming when the whole world is going to be at peace and all of these quarrels and events will come to an end forever. So he named it Rehobot, and that word means enmity, struggle. For the Lord said, at last the Lord has made room or space, broad places, literally in the Hebrew, Broad space, fruitfulness, wells of living water, all of these are brilliant symbols of the future that we haven't yet seen. Verse 23, he went up from there to Beersheba, that's to say well connected with an oath. We had Beersheba, an oath and a well were combined in the story earlier. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, Announcing who God is, we rehearsed this at the beginning of our program. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am. How many persons is I am? One person, the unitary monotheistic faith of the Bible and of Jesus. I'm the God of your father, your ancestor Abraham. Do not fear. That reminds me of Luke chapter 12. Fear not, little flock. Your father is delighted to give you the kingdom. Think about that. Don't fear. Don't be scared. I'm with you. That's a great thing to have God with you in your life. Overlooking our sins, because none of us acts righteously all the time. But God was nevertheless with these people. I'm going to bless you and multiply your seed, your descendants, for the sake of of my servant, my friend Abraham. So Abraham is the star, is he not, of the faith, the father of the faithful, and you should aspire then to having the faith of Abraham. 
overlooking the mistakes that Abraham made. We know he acted treacherously on a couple of occasions, lying about who Sarah was. That wasn't good, but God still counted Abraham as God's friend. So then an altar was built there. This is a happy resolution of this part of the story and called upon the name of the Lord, pitched his tent there, it means he settled down there to reside, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. All those are symbols of settlement, of peace, and the blessing of God. So then another happy scene in verse 26, the covenant is made with Abimelech, who is the king of Gerar, as you learned earlier. Abimelech came to him from Gerar with his advisor Ahuza and Fikol, the commander of his army. This man was a king, Abimelech. Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? What's going on here? And they said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. All right, so then the Christians, the true believers, are to provide a model which attracts other people to the faith. That's what happened here. We see plainly in verse 28 that the Lord God, the one God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, has been with you. That's the ideal. So we said, let there now be an oath between us. So we're attracted to your faith, Abraham. Let's make a covenant with you, an agreement, a berit, a covenant with you, so that you will do us no harm. This is a symbol of peace in a very limited sense. Yes, not world peace yet, but all of these things point to the time when the world is going to be at peace, when Jesus sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem in the future. Just as we have not touched you and we have done nothing bad to you, only good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So there's a happy spiritual agreement arising here as a little foretaste of the world peace that's going to come when Jesus will in the future sit on the throne of his father David. Not only that, it gets even better. They made him a feast. You've heard of the banquet, the feast at the second coming. There's a mini example of that. Made him a feast. They ate and drank. That's a symbol of happiness, prosperity, peace, and so on. In the morning, they rose early. Interesting. They got up early. They're ready to move on to the next things. And they exchanged oaths. They actually gave an oath to solidify this happy covenant relationship. Then Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. Depart in peace is a happy symbol of agreement. So he called it Sheba, 33 there. Therefore the name of the city is Vir Sheba, well of the oath that to do with the well of water and to do with an oath as we read in genesis 21 we've seen this story before and the final note in the 34 esau was 40 years old he married judith the daughter of beery the hittite these were not god's chosen people but foreigners hittites and basamat the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. But we finish on a rather sad note. These wives, unfortunately, brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. So the story is not finally resolved yet. We haven't got world peace. We've got conflict and struggle, fighting over wells, some degree of peacefulness, but nothing like the peace that we're going to have when the kingdom of God will be established in the future. Okay, so that's all I can think of to say on these extraordinary chapters, Carlos. Yep, thanks, Anthony. So let's see. Uh, we have uh, here the uh, one of the many references to do not fear. Yes. 
Um, do, do you know why? It's so some say it's the uh, most uh, the most uh, often said commandment yes. by God. So you have it there in verse twenty four. Yes. I, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for mm -hmm. I am with you. Yes. Um, would you know why that is so much yeah, repeated? Much in that we need that encouragement. I gave you the verse in Luke 12. Fear not, Jesus said to the disciples, your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's not just to be in the kingdom, but to be the kingdom. You're going to possess the rulership of the world. Do not fear, appears, as you rightly put it up on the screen there, 365 times because our tendency is not to trust God so don't, don't be scared I'm on your side you're going to rule the world I'll repeat the verse I gave you earlier and that is that God is the one Jeremiah 27 verse 5 I'm the one God says who is going to rule the world that's the Bible story in a nutshell who's going to be the president of the world that's the only issue that really matters. And the Christians, that's the international Israel of God, Galatians 6, 16, are in training for reigning. They're schooling for ruling, not to go to heaven and play a harp in the, on a pink cloud. That would be very boring, but to rule the world. Blessed are the meek. They're going to possess the kingdom of God. May your will be done on the earth these are the topics with which the mind of Jesus is filled day after day after day. I read, uh, while well, you were disconnected, Anthony, I read a, a Ryrie study Bible mm -hmm. on the previous chapter Good. about uh, his children. Uh, though Abraham provided for all his children by giving them gifts, probably mm -hmm. starter flocks and herds, <laughs> I, Ryrie says that he nonetheless dismissed them and made Isaac his principal heir. If you want to comment on Well, that's interesting. So the physical things that were given, it's very kind of Abraham, it was very generous. But more important, I would say, was the fact that Isaac, Isaac and Rebecca, you can remember that couple because of the K sound in both words, Isaac and Rebecca, Isaac was the principal heir. That's what really counted. Heir to the promise made to Abraham that he would be heir of the world. That's in Romans, of course. The promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the true faithful people who have the faith of Abraham are going to possess the world. If that doesn't get your attention, I don't know what would. I didn't learn that in church, by the way. Okay. Yeah, uh, also just a brief comment about this. Uh, Abraham gave everything to Isaac, but Abraham gave gifts to his grandchildren that he had through his concubines. That's interesting. He had three wives altogether, one genuine wife, two concubines. That was permitted in those days. That's not what we do, of course, under the new covenant in its developed form, which is our covenant now. All right. Thanks, Anthony. We will leave it there. So we shall be back next Sunday, God willing. Let's see. We will start in Jacob's Deception, <laughs> uh, chapter 27 of Genesis, as we go through the book of origin or origins, if you will. Okay. Before we go, uh, I was just explaining earlier also about death in the Bible. And um, there is a phrase there. Uh, let's see if I can find it again. About being gathered to your people when you die. And uh, the phrase, here we go. The phrase gather to his people, go to thy fathers to sleep with my fathers. They're all synonyms for um, the grave and people who are dead. In other words, they're not alive. If you're dead, you're not alive. If you're sleeping, you're not awake, which is the metaphor. So before we wrap up here, just a quick video on 
the topic of the grave. So in Hebrew is Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, as it's transliterated from the Hebrew. And it's translated in the Greek as Hades. And uh, just a quick video on that. What did Jesus really mean by Hades and Gehenna, the grave versus hell or hellfire? Some of you might know that there's been a movement in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 or so years among evangelicals of mainstream Christendom have started to rethink hell. And here's a good example of that. This is a website called rethinkinghell.com, which houses and represents a lot of these um, ideas. This is due simply to the fact that they're looking at the scriptures and further studies of them in relation to traditional eternal hell, the Catholic notion that the wicked are currently in this place underground called hell, being tortured, and they will remain in that state for eternity. So many are rethinking that in light of scripture. One of the main scriptures to push the so-called eternal torment, eternal hell doctrine is in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. But one thing I noted uh, long ago in verse uh, 23 of chapter 16, it says that the day came that the rich man also died. In hell, it says, he looked up from his torment and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side or in his bosom. So most translations will have here the word Hades, the Greek there, translated as hell. Now in the book, the fire that consumes by the late Edward Fudge, evangelical Christian, he says the the word Hades came into biblical usage when the Septuagint translator chose it to represent the Hebrew shell, an Old Testament concept vastly different from the pagan Greek notions of the immortal soul. Shell too received all the dead, but the Old Testament has no specific division there involving either punishment or reward. Dr. Warren in Dead Man Talking says that in that verse in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus uses a word to describe hell, that is Hades, that's different from the word he has always used to speak of judgment and hell, which is the Greek Gehenna, which leads one to think that it's a borrowed story and a borrowed word. So I'll show you here what Jesus means by these two words, Hades, which is erroneously translated as hell, and Gehenna. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, and you Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Matthew 16, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Luke 10, and you, again Capernaum, you will be exalted to heaven, you shall be brought down to Hades. What Jesus is actually saying here, he's not saying that Capernaum will go to hell, to this place underground of eternal torment via fire, but he's simply saying that they're going to be destroyed, they will go to the ground, to the grave. Again, as Fudge observes, Hades translates the Hebrew word shell, which in the Old Testament, and this is what most evangelicals are finally coming to realize, it simply means the grave. And then you have those references there in Job and many others. The grave equals there the gates of shell. And that's what Jesus is actually re referencing in Matthew 16. Those gates, the gates of the dead. Now the word approximating hell really is hellfire is this word Gehenna. So in Matthew 5, Jesus says, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the fire of Gehenna. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into Gehenna. Don't fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. By the way, note that Jesus clearly says 
in this verse that the soul is not immortal. Just right there, it debunks the whole eternal torment of your disembodied soul. And then again, Matthew 18, it's better to go into the kingdom with one limb or one eye than to be thrown into the fire of Gehenna. The word here, Gehenna, approximates to this idea of hell, but not an eternal torment, but simply as a place of destruction. The lake of fire, that's what Gehenna is. Gehenna is judgment. It's not the word Hades as it's used in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So the rich man did not go to Gehenna. Jesus says in that story, which is a parable, that he simply went to the grave. And then Jesus tells a story about that as a parable, not as a reality. And more verses here in Mark 9, the lake of fire, destruction, judgment, annihilation, total destruction by fire. This will begin at the parousia. At present, all the dead are said to be in the New Testament sleeping in Hades. So I hope that helped uh, here at some of the notes for that video on one of our blogs and uh, what Jesus meant but by Hades. Uh, which is the grave shell and Gehenna, the lake of fire. I'll post it in the link for anyone interested. And we have many, many videos on this topic, uh, also on so-called eternal punishment or quote-unquote hell. And uh, you can check those out on our YouTube uh, page. <clears throat> okay, before we go, some comments here from people online on YouTube, uh, interview with uh, Dr. Rubenstein. Thanks for bringing his work before the public. His contribution was important. And uh, he wrote a book called When Jesus Became God. He's a, uh, a Jew, a practicing Jew, I believe, and historian. So check him out. On a video I did against uh, the Trinitarian apologist Anthony Rogers, at best erroneous by Rogers, at worst dishonest. And that's uh, the use of the plural verbs uh, for God that sometimes appear in the Old Testament, as I explained in that video. On Anthony's uh, debate long ago with James White and Michael Brown, Honestly, I don't think Trinitarians will be convinced, even with solid evidence and solid logic. Jehovah God says in Ezekiel 3, 27, let the one listening listen, let the one refusing to listen refuse. I think that's the best attitude with Trinitarians. Well, we must keep trying though, or else find something else to do with our lives. Um, Dr. Brown clearly forgot that Jesus is the Son of God and belittles Jesus from the Unitarian position. On, uh, let's see, a debate I had on the uh, law and Paul, the law of Moses. Thank you, Carlos, for sharing the truth. Get them off the tutor and bring them to Christ. Uh, by that, I think that's a reference to Paul calling the law of Moses a guardian or a tutor. I think it's in Galatians. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Let's see. On a my last debate was uh, against a Christadelphian. That's a small non-Trinitarian group that does not believe in a personal devil or demons. This person writes, dude, how can you be a Christian and believe in the Holy Bible, but not believe the enemy is real? This is almost like Gnosticism, where it's believed that you are your own God and that the Most High is actually the Demiurge, that is a, a small letter God, a lower God in Gnosticism, and made this realm to enslave our spirits. Total buoy? <laughs> I think that's how you say that. Christ is clear, the Holy Bible is clear, and you, brother, are very clear. God bless you for standing up to the BS. <laughs> if you do not believe in the enemy, surely he will fool you easily. 
Well, thanks for that. Uh, let's see. On a video on Jehovah's Witnesses. Hi there, I'm a former JW looking to understand the things we were wrongly taught as JWs. I just want to thank you for all, all for having this discussion. It has been very enlightening. Thank you for that. And we have many videos on the so-called organization, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, that's it for now. Remember to keep uh, our sister Tracy in your prayers. She's traveling in Europe for a few weeks. And um, others out there, uh, Kay, our, our sister here in our church, for her health and the health of Barbara and uh, Jenny in Australia as for prayer recently. So please keep them in your prayers as we wrap wrap up here father we thank you for the ability to do this for us uh, who are able to do this on a daily basis as a job we ask for prayers for tracy and everyone out there with any health issues or requests and prayers we pray for this country and the recent uh, political turmoil we pray that the rest of this year may go well in the election year that we have here in 2024. We pray for peace, peace, stability, the governors, the presidents, prime ministers of this world, so we can continue to do what we're doing now in peace and safety. So we pray for them so that they may leave us alone. We pray for those uh, currently facing persecution for the faith around the world. And um, once again, we pray for these, uh, this world and those who are yet to hear the sound doctrine of our Lord Jesus and the great faith exemplified by our father Abraham and his sons. And in the name of Jesus, we always pray. Amen. So God bless everyone until we meet again.